Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 177, Top 10 Euro Games. We like to thank all of our Patreon backers for helping us bring you an ad-free episode. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast about board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. And this is Anthony. Anthony, we are still enjoying the wonderful sun that the board game convention season brings us because there's a lot of warmth, there's a lot of cardboard. It's all good, man. Gen Con's coming up. How you feeling? I'm good. I'm not doing any conventions at the moment, but it's been nice and sunny. I got to play TI4 today. That makes me happy. I know you were at a convention most of the last week, and most of our fellow network participants were in Orlando for the week. So I'm a little jealous, but <laughs> I did get to play TI4, so it balances out a little. That's a tough sure. one to get out. Yes, I just recently got back from Dexcon 2018 from our friends at double exposure up in morristown new jersey if you did get a chance to get out there you probably had a great time like i did the weather was great the area is great and a lot of great games definitely got hit to hit the table mayday games was there rnr games was there indie board and cards were there and smirk and dagger our old friends are, are always somewhere hanging out so a lot of good times there but i will be talking about that as the episode goes on and also dice tower con just recently wrapped up and our friends in the network recently gave out their awards. So, Anthony, why don't you just kind of give us an idea of what happened? Yeah, yeah. The Dice Tower Awards are given out every year at Dice Tower Con. We are among the voters, but uh, we were not at the con, unfortunately. We did get to uh, participate in the voting along with everybody else in the network and a lot of other people in the industry. And it's kind of cool always to see who wins out and which ones we got right and which ones we didn't. So, um, by far, the winner of the night was Gloomhaven with their four or five awards that they took away, almost half of them overall. And honestly, most of these awards I agree with. We Game of the Year was Gloomhaven. We had artwork what to near and far. That's one where I feel like there's a lot of good games in that category, so could have gone in a few different directions, but you know they were all good. The one I'm most proud of, though, not necessarily just because we voted for it, but because we kind of predicted it back in February with our bracket, best board game production went to Photosynthesis. Woo-hoo. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Our components bracket, this was the one we picked. So that's there you go. It's, it's true. And there was a lot of competition for it. So congratulations to Blue Orange Games and an outstanding production as far as those 3D trees and that kind of sudden that kind of moved around the board it was pretty interesting as well. Yeah, it's fantastic stuff. Best co-op, Gloomhaven, of course, best expansion, Star Wars, Rebellion, Rise of the Empire. 100% agree on that. Best family game, Azul. I'm okay with that. Best new designer and best new spell publisher, Gloomhaven. Um, again, no problems there. Uh, best party game was Magic Maze. I think this is the one that I, I would pick a bone with. Yes. I'm fine with Magic Maze. I don't love it. I know you don't love it either. Um, nope. But I think I like it a little bit more than you. But the other nominees were Word Slam, Meeple Circus, Rhino Here, and Where Words, all four of which I like better. So I was Same a little here. disappointed. That's absolutely true. Best reprint went to Downforce. I'm okay with that. But there was, again, a lot of good nominees in this category. Uh, Best strategy game went to Gloomhaven. Best strategy is like the one category we get as the heavier gamers. So Gloomhaven's, you know, a dungeon crawl with some strategy elements. I would have loved to see Anachrony or Spirit Island here or even Dinosaur Island. But Gloomhaven's a good game, so that's fine. And then best theming was This War of Mine, which is, for everything I know about the game, just incredibly depressing. So I guess it's a good theming for being depressing yeah i mean the game does give that kind of mood to it so they did a really good job as far as theming the game is concerned but as you said anthony we are definitely on the heaviest of the end for the dice tower network and as far as strategy game tom and i have kind of went around in circles about this i feel like there should be a best tactics game which i feel like would fit gloomhaven a lot better because while there is strategy as far as building your your hand before you go into the dungeon, still it's it's tactical as far as what you're going to be playing. I would have loved to see a Spirit Island 
where you do have to plan long term and you do have to kind of connect everything together because we're heavy gamers and those decisions are really our bread and butter. You know, the heavier they are, the better. So actually, that's going to be our episode today. So we're going to talk about some of the heaviest board games that are out there and let you know what should probably be on everyone's list, especially Dice Tower's awards winning list. (laughs) <laughs> and let you know what makes them so great. But before we get into all of that heavy gaming, Anthony, what's going on with everybody out there? What's our question of the week? All right. So I had a fun one for you guys. And we didn't have a ton of these just because it was a holiday last week. And we had a few episodes that could went up. But this one came out uh, a few days ago. And it was, what 80s IP would you like to see next get a board game reimagining? So we've been kind of in this recent rush of people buying up 80s IPs and turning them into board <laughs> games. We have The Thing, we have Rambo, uh, we have the Terminator, all this stuff is just kind of rushing out there. And it's it's not going to stop, I'd imagine, because <laughs> they're making a ton of money on Kickstarter. So I asked everybody what they thought, and we got a lot of good answers. Michael says a G.I. Joe versus Cobra deck builder. And then George jumped in and said a G.I. Joe minis game. Uh, I think there's a good chance we see both of those at some point. So um, I'm surprised we haven't seen G.I. Joe yet, to be honest. Rodney mentions a Princess Bride minis game. We have like four Princess Bride games at this point, but none of them are any good. So I'd be fine with a good one. Willie mentions we need a real Voltron board game, and I'm 100% on board with this. I'd love a real Voltron board game. I think there's a good chance of this too, because we have the 80s nostalgia plus the Netflix show right now, which is in like season five. Um, So Voltron's a thing that people are watching old and young. So um, I could see that happening. Tim mentions a V hidden trader game. I think that'd be pretty cool. Kind of in the line of like Battlestar. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tom says Ferris Bueller's Day Off in which you have to find your way to town and find your way home before your parents and sister find out. Um, Willie mentions remake of Battle at Kemble's Cascade with the Last Starfighter IP, which I think would be great. That was a fun game. It's just mm-hmm. it was such a gen- like a random generic IP that nobody recognized. Cat mentions He Man and She Rock Castle Panic, and then we wow. have Indiana Jones, of course. I'm surprised nobody mentioned it before that. And then Puppet Master. What do you think? I remember Puppet Master. That was kind of like these little killer puppets back in the day, where like stop motion was still a big thing. Yeah, I probably would have to go with something that was music based. The '80s was really known for their big hair bands, their big color. Uh, rap music really kind of took hold and I would love to see a game that kind of reflected the music not like drop mix so much as far as having this giant piece of plastic kind of out there but something that allowed you to kind of like you know start a band from the beginning and kind of like have these different asymmetrical powers where you had the heavy metal and you had the kind of the brand new rap stars that were coming out there just just something fun and colorful that kind of reflected the 80s and all the excess of the times. Maybe one of those kind of like behind the music, the board game. Can your band survive? All that kind of craziness. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. Would it be like an, a documentary or a mockumentary? Are you turning it up to 11? What are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Anthony? Um, I would love to. Like, I've actually gotten into this uh, Karate Kid reboot lately that's on YouTube. Have you seen this? Sure. It's this super cheesy show on YouTube, but it's very endearing, and it manages to like perfectly capture what you think you remember the Karate Kid TV, the Karate Kid movie was like. If you watch that movie, it's it's not it's not great, but it it feels like what you remember seeing. Um, so I'd love to see like a Karate Kid board game in which you're, you know, like leveling up and trying to gain these different karate skills so you can enter the All Valley Tournament, and then you know just have like that one final fight at the end of it. Something like Colosseum even be kind of cool, like multiple fights and then just the highest score you get at the end wins. That'd be kind of cool. I don't think we've seen anything quite like that. Yeah, there's so many good IPs out there for the 80s because theme was rich and everything and was really popping. And I guess locking as well because it was the 80s. So keep an eye out because we're going to see a lot more of those games to come. Obviously, I, we've gotten plenty of Big Trouble in Little China, which was a favorite of mine, especially before the theme is concerned. We'll definitely have to do an episode with the, you know, maybe the best IPs for uh, each decade, Anthony. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fantastic. All right. So that's everything that's happening with our listeners on our Facebook group. Don't forget, our social media is out there for you to connect with us. So check out our Facebook, Twitter, BoardGamersAnonymous.com. There's always brand new content going up there. Read our reviews. Check out our podcast. You can reach us a whole bunch of different ways. We're pretty much on every platform you can find. And, of course, 
you can always go to our website to download the episode or jump onto YouTube. Great places to find us, listen, share, and just connect with gamers out there. All right, Anthony, so that's what's going on there. Let's talk about what's going on with us. What's on your acquisition disorders for this week? Okay, so it is that time of year, and it means a new Stefan Feld game has been announced. Um, yay! Yay! Actually, there's two, Woo-hoo! which uh, I don't actually have the information about the second one, but it shows up in the threads for this one, and that he has two different games coming out, one from Alea and one from Hutch. And Hutch is usually distributed in the U.S. by R&R, but also Academy has some kind of relationship with them and their kids' games. So we'll see who ends up picking this up and bringing it here. But it's probably coming here. It's probably going to be me picking it up and bringing it here. Yeah, I hope so, yeah. <laughs> so it's called Forum Trajanum, and it is not Trajan. It's not the sequel to Trajan, but it's about Trajan. And Trajan was an emperor in the Roman Republic. And in this particular case, you were helping him to build a monument, the Forum Trajanum. And the, the idea here is that you kind of run your own little space. So you have your own city in the empire. You're building it up. You're optimizing it. There's tile placement involved. Everybody has their own kind of player powers that they're working with. But you're also working together to build this uh, monument. And you'll gain points and credibility based on how much of that you do. And this is kind of a new... It's not a new theme at all that we see in games. But I'm seeing it more often of late. In which there's kind of a shared thing that you're trying to accomplish. And I just played a game recently called Lowlands that just came out, has that built into it. Terraforming Mars has that built into it, where there's a shared condition in the game that everybody has to work towards. And if nobody does it, it hurts you. If everybody does it, nothing happens. If one person does it, it benefits them in some way. Um, And so it seems kind of like along those lines. It's ancient Rome. It's got artwork by Michael Menzel. He did the artwork for Bruges, um, which is great. It's one of the better illustrated games that Feld has released. Uh, And so I'm pretty excited about this one. It'll be interesting to see. Like his last few games have been very diverse in terms of mechanics. Um, he's tried. He's had a racing game. He's had a roll and move game. Uh, I'm interested to see how this one plays out and if it goes back to kind of the point salad of Feld of old, or if it's uh, something new and unique yet again. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I think this one's coming out in Essen. I don't know that it was confirmed in the thread just yet, but usually when new games are announced this time of year, they are end of year releases. So. Looking forward to this one. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this as well. So, Anthony, usually we try to talk about games that we want to kind of like entice you with. We want to get you to pick up, especially when it comes to Kickstarter games and especially when it comes to CMON games, because they've always done an outstanding job with not just theme, but also with production and sometimes some really amazing mechanics. But now I want to warn you, Anthony, there is another game that's coming out and it's going to drive you a little insane because it is yes it is another cthulhu game Woo! <laughs> i think you're supposed <laughs> to scream in horror at that oh sorry sorry i was waiting for you to say a game that's going to entice me to go spend money and thus far you have not done that so. no this game is going to drive you to insanity so in that way simon has done an outstanding job with the theme because not only is the game itself about the cthulhu mythos where the dead, they never die. They just kind of fall asleep and plague the earth. And you are one of these investigators that are trying to stop this ritual from happening, but you can't stop it. So the Cthulhu elders are going to be coming out and they're going to be messing with the earth. So the best that you can do is set up a situation where you can take down Cthulhu and all of these elder gods. So you're looking at a miniatures game. You are looking at a kind of a little bit of a dungeon crawl. But the game is basically about investigation. So there's going to be multiple investigation packs here. And once again, it's going to be the Cthulhu Mythos. So if you're not familiar with that, I don't know what Elder God you've been under this time. But once again, cosmic evil coming to Earth, driving people insane. So you're going to have a sanity bar, which you're going to try to manage along with other skills. Great miniatures here. But here comes the pure insanity of the game. It has the Cthulhu miniature that is as big as a toddler. Quite literally. Quite literally. There's a photo going around of someone's toddler sitting next to this miniature. She looks very interested, though. (laughs) (laughs) I think she's the only one that could stare the Cthulhu in the face and not go completely (laughs) insane. But this miniature, which should not be classified as a miniature at this point, is insanely large chunk of plastic, well detailed as all of the cool mini or not stuff tends to be. So 
this Kickstarter will be kicking off this coming Tuesday. So when you listen to this, look out. Cthulhu's coming in the most extreme forms possible. I, I think it's safe to say that this gigantic Cthulhu miniature is going to be an add-on because I don't know how they would be able to price the game otherwise. But the theme is going to drive you insane. The price is probably going to drive you insane. And if those two don't do it, this miniature is going to drive you insane. And if you're just a great big Cthulhu fan, you're going to be, I guess, insane with happiness that this is coming out? I guess. Yeah. I don't know what to make of this, but I'm not a Cthulhu fan. So I'm just happy for those who are because you're not just buying miniatures now. You're buying statues. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> I think that's secretly one of these kind of like cultist actions maybe they're working at simon and, and and board gaming and if like enough giant cthulhu miniatures gets out into the world it will summon cthulhu yeah it makes sense yeah, yeah. i mean why else would you make a two foot tall <laughs> cthulhu miniature this is by rob davio and eric lang who always do outstanding productions for games and really interesting mechanics so we will have to see so keep an eye out for for cthulhu death may die this coming tuesday all right, Anthony, so that's our acquisition disorders. Insane or not, we are moving on to our at the table. So what did you get to the table this week? Okay, um, I'm going to talk about a uh, new game that's pretty hot right now. It's Century Eastern Wonders uh, from Plan B Games, Emerson Matsuchi. Game number two in the Century trilogy. Picked this up at Origins recently, and then it launched to the rest of the world last week. And it is a pick-up-and-deliver game. So it's not the same mechanics that you saw in Spice Road, but it does use a lot of the same mechanisms. So let me explain that what that is. At the beginning of the game, you're going to set up a map. It's variable based on the number of players. Um, there is a player mat that will help you do this unless you leave it in your hotel room in Columbus, Ohio, and then you don't have it. Hint, hint. Don't leave your stuff in your hotel room as I did. The the game, though, is it's relatively easy to set up, regardless of whether you have the play mat and the the way you end up kind of mapping things out um, from there is and people will take turns, they rotate through, and you will choose on your turn to start the game either where you want to start on the map or which resources you want to start with. And then you'll take the other one as well. So it's kind of a, a draft to start the game. On your turn, you're just going to do uh, one of three things. First, regardless of those three things, you're going to move your ship. And then second, you are going to build... Uh, and place out one of your trading posts. If there's nobody there, you just put it out there for free. If someone's already there, you have to pay resources to the bank. And then you can use the ability of the space you're on. And all these abilities are trade X goods for Y goods. So two greens for a brown, two yellows for a red, whatever it ends up being. It's the same as in Spice Road. You have four different colors of cubes. They go yellow, red, green, brown, higher qualities you go up. I think the actual resources names are different. But especially if you're playing this alongside Spice Road, who cares what they're called? It's yellow, red, green, brown. It's very <laughs> abstracted. Um, so you're trying to build these up. You can carry 10 at any time. You have a grid on your player mat of these um, trading posts that's uh, four by five. And the, each of the tiles corresponds to one of the different four types of things. And then you'll take the trading post from that row. Uh, so if you take a red one, you'll take the red, you place it out. And every time you finish a column, of these different trading posts that you complete, you get to take a bonus. And the bonuses are things like every time you take a harvest action, um, which is the second action type, which just gives you goods, you get also an extra red. So instead of the two yellow, you also get a red. Um, one of them is you get to move your ship one space further. So normally you can only move one, now you can move two. So just little stuff like that that kind of powers you up as the game goes along. You're gonna keep doing this and doing this and doing this until you have enough to complete one of the contracts at the four ports. The, um, the four ports are at the edges of the map. You move there. And then this is the third action type. You turn in those goods. You take that contract as your own. It has a certain amount of victory points on it. Again, very much like Spice Road. And then once you have four or someone else has four, that's the final round of the game. You see how many points you have. Uh, the points you get are for those contracts, for the spaces you clear off your mat for trading posts. Some of them have, uh, as you go along further out, uh, they have uh, victory points on the bottom. And then for the goods you still have in your hold. Everything that's not yellow is worth a point each. Uh, some of these little tiles, too, that you pick up is bonuses. I have points on them. One of the stacks is just victory points, so that's another way to get points. It is relatively quick, very, very simple to teach, um, but has a lot more, I feel like, 
things going on, things to think about, strategy to work out, you know, what things do you rush for to put your trading posts on early so that they're yours and you have them for later. Uh, other people want to take them later. That's fine, but they have to pay extra to get there. You know, what path do you want to take to get your upgrades? How fast do you want to move? Which upgrades and port, you know, contracts you want to complete early? I feel like there's a lot more decisions to be made than in Spice Road. Spice Road is really about the cards that are there when it's your turn and what you can afford. Um, that it's not quite on the level of like a Splendor that plays itself, but it's in between uh, for Spice Road. This one is definitely more on the pickup and deliver side where you make a plan, you follow through on that plan, and you kind of race other people for things. I like that a lot. And it's on the gateway side of the, the pickup and deliver genre. So whereas Spice Road for me is a strong play, I'm going to give Eastern Wonders a buy. I think it's solid. I think it's easy to teach. I think it's a fun, quick, and fulfilling game for what it is. And it's relatively inexpensive for what you get. I'm, I'm quite impressed with this. I'm even more impressed that the second game of the series is a little bit better than the first. There's a second game mode, which I didn't really mention, where you use the cards from Spice Road as a second part of the game. You'll be using those to kind of, you know, trigger and take actions as well. I haven't really played that too much, so not really reviewing that part of it. For, but for people who have both, it's kind of a cool upgrade and add-on that you can put into this. So Century Eastern Wonders, definitely worth picking up. If you like the first one, you'll definitely like this. If you're iffy on the first one, but you like pick up and deliver, give this one a play and then see if it's for you. Yeah, I'm really glad to hear this. I mean, I really enjoy pick up and deliver games. I've enjoyed Century Spice Road a lot. I actually like it more than you do. But I'm glad that we're actually going to have another gateway game that is a solid gateway game that can kind of bring people into the heavier kind of pick up and deliver games. So I'm really excited about that. I absolutely, totally love the integration with other games. And that's actually a topic that we have coming up. So being able to do both those things are super innovative and always good to see a gateway game come into play. Yeah, yeah, I think this is a really good entry into the gateway space. And it stands alone because there's not a lot of good gateway pickup and deliver, but there's a lot of good medium pickup and deliver. So if you have those, you want people to play them, definitely get this and kind of get them into that genre. So a game that's currently up for the Kenner Spiel is, and now I'm going to call for my pronunciation stunt double, Anthony. <laughs> De Quacksalber von Quedlinburg. What he said. So I got to play this game that's eventually going to get an English title, I'm sure, at some point, because it's going to be carried by Northstar Games here in the U.S. And basically what this comes down to is these potion quacks putting together these various different formulas using a cauldron and all of these kind of mythical different ingredients that goes into their potions in order to kind of sell at the different markets. So basically the board itself is this kind of flat quadrant that's kind of your individual player board and it's numbered from zero to 35. And what you're going to be doing in this game is you're going to be pulling out randomly tokens from this bag and then adding it to your potion. If at any point you get more than seven snow peas, then you bust and you'll have an opportunity to either score the different bubbles and this kind of concoction that you made either by their victory points or by their money that's going to allow you to buy additional ingredients to add to your potion. Now, as I said, this is a press your luck game. So basically the market is gonna be very important as far as what ingredients do you decide to add to your bag that you're gonna pull out and add to your potion. Now, some of the ingredients are pretty straightforward. So pumpkins are going to give you one space because you basically want to kind of spiral out until you get to the highest numbers possible because that's going to give you the most money possible to buy the most ingredients possible and give you the most victory points possible. But some ingredients are going to give you special abilities when they're pulled and put into play. So, for example, there's like a mandrake that's available that's going to put some of those snow peas back into your bag so you can press your luck a little bit more. And as the game goes on, you're going to be able to have more and more money that's going to allow you to purchase things that are a little bit more powerful into your bag that are going to give you things like extra victory points and especially crystals. Crystals are very important in this game because you do have a potion that will allow you to put one of the high tokens that's gonna make you bust back into your bag. But later on, those different crystals are gonna be able to allow you to refresh that potion. 
Throughout the game, you're going to have this little drop token that's going to move up, which is going to help you get to the higher levels. And then at the end of each round, the person who's got furthest on their potion board is going to roll a die for an extra bonus. Those extra ingredients are going to score. You'll claim extra crystals based upon where you end with the potion. You're going to be able to refresh your potion or move your draw for two additional crystals. You'll be playing this over several different rounds with special event cards coming into play, which will basically give you extra bonuses based upon what materials you have in your potion bag or just give you kind of a little bonus to kind of help you along. This is a light an engaging game, especially a press your luck game. But what I really found enjoyable about the game was the market allowed you to mitigate your luck and allowed you to put together a unique combination of ingredients in order to kind of press your luck to hit that 35 mark. You could go really heavy with only a few different items, or you can kind of like, you know, water down your potions with a lot of smaller items so that you don't get a lot of those snow berries. So this game is definitely worth the buy. I definitely recommend you picking up this game when it does eventually get to market because it really has a nice balance, as I mentioned before, and it's light enough that pretty much anyone can play it. It sounds really interesting. I, Based on the name and the minimal amount of information we had about it before it got nominated, I was not sure what to expect, but uh, I'm intrigued now. Yeah, and the artwork is really nice in this game, and it's pretty much a... I, I'm assuming it's going to be at a low price point when this eventually does get out. So it's definitely a high recommendation for me. All right, Anthony. So that's what's been hitting our table this week. Let's get on to our feature review. So for our feature review this week, we are talking about the top 10 heavy Euro games. So Anthony and I happen to be big fans of the heavy stuff. And we're always getting those to the table or at the convention table. So we want to give you the top 10 best ones that we've played. There's a lot of other super heavy 18 double X games, but here we are talking about games that offer unique complexity. So these are probably a little bit of your longer games, but they're so much fun, especially where you can kind of have interesting challenges and just unique mechanics. What do you think about these games, Anthony? Yeah, I mean, this is kind of the stuff that we live for. I mean, we talk about a lot of games. We like a lot of games. So this is not like these are the only games we like, but these are the hardest ones to get to the table. And so and these are the ones that tend to sit highest in my echelon. Like if you look at our top 100 list, a lot of these are way up there. And that's for good reason. They're really good and they, they're very satisfying and enjoyable. And as heavy gamers, this is the kind of stuff we want to get to the table more often than not. So I think this is a good starting list if you're looking for like super heavy stuff. Like if you're it, like, it's all variable what people consider heavy, obviously. Like, for example, you just talked about, you know, the Kennerspiel nominees, which are considered the gamers games, but we would consider those light, right? It's, it's all it's all subjective. These are just straight up heavy. These are like four plus weight on BGG, if you know what that means. It's just out of a rank of five, one to five, these are four or higher in terms of complexity and for good reason. So these are the hardest of the hard if, if you're looking for the, your next heavy game. All right, Anthony. So with all of that said, let's get into the really crunchy games. Why don't you start us off with our number 10? Okay. So I knew I had to include a Phil Eklund joint on this list um he's worked on a lot of games designed a lot of games uh, you know high frontier is probably the heaviest game you'll ever see uh that isn't you know 18xx or some kind of war game but i went with a relatively more recent game um bios megafauna uh, the second edition which i just got a copy of in the last few months and i've had a chance to play a few times this is a game in which you play some kind of early creature a plant a mollusk an insect a, a vertebrae and you are trying to develop, you know, this is a game about evolution and building and becoming stronger. The, the idea here is that you're, you start on a certain part of land and you are trying to generate and build and gain dominance over everybody else. And there's a lot of things involved in this. Like any Eklund game, you've got everything from territory building. Of course, you need to have like control over the areas around you. Um, there's card drafting, so the different cards are going to be available to you and how you interact with the other players. And the, this whole idea of like a modular board that you build over the course of the game. It also integrates with BIOS Genesis, which is like the earlier version of this, where you start as a cell and work your way up. 
Um, he has a lot of games in this series, this uh, bio series, and this is the most recent. And I don't know if it's the most complicated, but it's the most brain burning I've played thus far. And uh, the one that I would recommend if you can find it uh, as a good place to start for, well, not to start, but, you know, for in terms of heavy, heavy games, if you want to dive in, uh, BIOS Mega Fun is a great place to be. All right, our number nine game is Antiquity. Now, Antiquity is one of those heavy splatter spiels games out there. It kind of took the gaming community by storm, and then unfortunately, because of its low print run, it kind of disappeared. But now it's back in a reprint if you want to pick up this game, and you should absolutely pick up this game. It's loosely based upon Italy during the Middle Ages, where these cities were growing up in the environment, and the environment was taking a few hits because every time you build up the city, you're going to do a, a pretty hard number on the, the local area. So a lot of these areas in which you're building up and, and getting resources from, they're going to become a little toxic. So the city is kind of responsible for cleaning up that those toxic areas. But basically what it comes down to is a lot of chits kind of encompass the different areas as you and your opponents try to claim as much area as possible to gain resources in order to build buildings build houses to bring out new workers and unfortunately those workers die as time goes on so you have to build little gravestones for them this game is kind of dripping with theme as far as building up this little city is concerned very strategic really dynamic as far as the game is concerned plays two to four players really beautiful kind of board set up as far as having the city available to kind of like build inside so you're going to kind of get this like ledger where you're going to kind of do this polyomino situation where you're putting these buildings together and on the board itself all of these chits are kind of going out there so you be able to gain resources but as i said earlier it's going to take a toll on the environment that's our number nine game antiquity all right so number eight on the list is anachrony anachrony is the second release from mind clash games um, from design trio of richard amon victor pater and david turchi it is a science fiction game in which a lot is happening the the basic theme of the game is it is about 600 years in the future and earth has basically been destroyed to some degree every player represents a different path of people trying to survive and there's a new cataclysm coming that's going to further destroy everybody so you have between four and seven rounds uh, it varies because the end of the game is variable based on when this cataclysm comes out and then you are going to do a lot of things on your turns so um, there's a two-tiered worker placement system. You have your own little workers that match up with different areas. There's engineers and scientists and geniuses and administrators that can do different things. And then you have exosuits that are needed to send them out to take certain actions. But you only have so many exosuits. You unlock more as the game goes along, but you start with a limited number, and you've kind of balanced that. There's also a very cool timeline mechanism here. The ability to go back in time and give yourself resources that you will then have to pay yourself back later just to keep the timeline straight. It's very interesting. You can, it, you're, you're basically borrowing things. It's kind of like a loan system, but the way it works, the way it fits into the theme, the way the timeline track works, not only for this particular mechanism, but for tracking the length of the game is very interesting. The game has a lot to wrap your mind around. It is a heavier game. It's up there. Not necessarily as high as some of these other games, but it takes a little bit to kind of wrap your mind around these different ideas and the time travel and all the different worker placement stuff. Once you do, though, it's very smooth. It flows very well. has a brilliant one-player mode, too, for people out there who like solo games uh, with a chrono bot that comes in the expansion. So if you want that, you need the expansion. And then if you want the mech miniatures, you also need the expansion. I just feel like I should mention that because the game is not super expensive. Uh, it's like 60 bucks, but if you want all the cool stuff with the minis, it's $100. Uh, but Anachrony, one of my favorite games right now, and uh, well worth checking out if you like unique themes, science fiction stuff, and worker placement with a unique twist to it. All right, our number seven game is Small City by our designer, Alban Villard. This is one of our favorite games for so many different reasons. It's basically SimCity as a heavy Euro game. Now, you probably played several of other games that have probably more recently hit the table, Town Center and Card City, just to name a two. But this game is so interesting because, first off, 
it's got this light kind of fun theme to it about kind to get the most votes possible in the city. So you're trying to attract as many people as possible to your city. But once again, you have to deal with some of the issues that come along with that. So you have pollution, you have crime. So what you want to do is ideally send your people to other people's cities in order to work and kind of leave some trash over there. But make your town as beautiful as possible. Build it up with enough structures and enough buildings, enough residential and commercial that you can. If you're looking for SimCity as a wonderful, crunchy game that in involves a lot of different action selection and managing pollution, Small City is definitely the way to go. That's our number seven game. All right, number six on the list is Gaia Prod. This is the new game in the line of Terra Mystica. So it is basically Terra Mystica in space. If you play Terra Mystica, you know the basics here. You start as one of several different unique races. You will build up different resources that you're gonna to use to put out different structures on different planets. Everybody starts with their own base planet. If you wanna build on a different planet, you need to terraform to some degree to get that planet to the level at which you can build. This is different from Terra Mystica in a lot of ways though in that there is now open space between the planets so you need to take into account how far you can travel, um, you need to be able to put satellites out to connect these different planets. The board is modular now, there are 10 different sectors that are going to come out during the game, they're going to determine where things go so it's a little bit different every time you play. Um, there are different areas of development that you can take. So you're moving up in these different tracks, um, unlike the priest tracks. So based on the different actions you take and things that you build, you'll move up in areas of terraforming to get more efficient there, navigation to be able to move further, artificial intelligence, Gaia forming um, to be able to terraform specific Gaia planets that give you bonuses and are worth more points later on economy and research. There are also end game bonuses, advanced technologies, Lots and lots of stuff to keep track of in this game. At its core, it is a root and network building game with variable player powers and a, a lot of an economic engine that you're kind of building up. But there's just so many unique twists and turns here. And with so many different races in the game to choose from and so many different ways to play the game, it'll be different every time you play it unless you play it a lot. I always liked Terra Mystica a lot. Gaia Project, I love and it's definitely well worth checking out if you're looking for your next big heavy euro. All right, our number five game is Dominant Species. Now, Dominant Species is probably unique in a way that only real big fans of Park and Recreations probably knows. The Cones of Dunshire game that was kind of like fictionally created and then actually became a game. It, you know it because it has all these little kind of cones and little pieces and squares and kind of is supposed to be the most intimidating board game of all time. But Dominant Species really isn't that intimidating, but it is that epic. Happening at least 90,000 years ago, the Ice Age is rolling in, and you as one of these different animal classes, whether it's an amphibian, a reptile, an arachnid, a mammal, bird, or insect, is fighting for domination of the land as it shrinks from this oncoming, this oncoming Ice Age. So basically what you're going to do is you have your special animal class and your animal is going to benefit from certain resources in which you'll be able to consume for food. And as the different rounds come up, you'll be able to adapt and your species will become more diverse, being able to utilize different food sources as it expands through these different lands, as the Ice Age kind of pushes on to the different hexes and kind of wipes different species out. So it's survival of the fittest through adaptation. Now, the game is pretty simple because basically what it's going to come down to is putting your species out on the board, utilizing cubes. But what's most fun about this game and what we've seen a lot of different things is being able to put your cylinders on different actions. So you can adapt. You can add abundance of different foods that are out there. You can also kind of move the glacier itself so you can wipe out your enemies you can be able to put your species on different places, or you could try to claim dominance in certain areas and gain these super powerful action cards that are gonna destroy different areas, allow you to spread to different areas, and hopefully allow you to gain dominance over different areas. So that's Dominant Species, our number five game. All right, moving on to number four. Um, and you, you guys will notice that we're 
having to consolidate a little bit. These are big, heavy games, lots of mechanics. We can't describe them perfectly. Arc Raid is a perfect example. This game has a lot going on to it. Um, this is our number four game, and it is a lot of things to kind of keep track of. The basic idea of the game is that you're running up to four factories in this 18th century, and you are trying to, the ultimate goal of the game is to have the highest value of your own shares. So you have to not only buy your shares from the bank, so the, you, most of those shares start the game in the bank, not all of them, but most of them, but you also increase the share value. So you kind of balance when you buy them with when you increase the value. The higher the value is, the more you pay to get them, but it's also hard to increase the value if once you buy them. The, the way you do that is to run factories. You get workers from this vast pool of workers and this giant economy of workers, like demand for those workers increases as they're purchased. So the more workers are hired, the more they cost to hire. But you can also replace workers with machines. That is another whole thing to keep track of. On your round, you're going to be placing out different tokens. You can run multiple factories at a time. You can modernize factories. You can employ new workers. You can improve quality in those different factories. Um, there's a lot to keep track of here in terms of what you want to do. You know, some people might decide to run all of their factories and just try to be maximizing output and get a lot out of them. Other people might pick two or three of those factories and really focus in on them and, you know, try to get the most out of those, max out those tracks. And other people might just decide to ship out to the colonies and focus on the home market and generate resources and money that way. The interesting thing about this game is it comes with two versions you can play. You can play the short version, quote unquote, Spinning Jenny. Um, the box says 120 minutes, but that's silly. It's about three to four hours. And then there's the 240 minute version, Waterframe. It says it's a four hour game. You're probably looking at five to six. So it is a long game with a lot of stuff in it. I like that it comes with a shorter way to play when you're teaching new people. Um, good way to get people involved as you build them up. A lot to keep track of. Love it, though. This is Arkwright uh, from Capstone Games. All right, our number three game is Lisboa by one of our favorite designers, Vitala Serta, with the artwork by Ian O'Toole. Now, in Lisboa, what we're dealing with was a great tragedy that happened in the city of Lisboa in Portugal. They had a level nine earthquake followed by a tsunami, followed by three days of fire. So this is where you jump into the game because you are working with the government in order to utilize the rubble from those tragedies in order to rebuild the city and claim prominence in Lisboa. So basically what you're doing is you're going to have a set of cards in your hand and each of those cards have a number of different things you could do with them. But typically you're going to be playing them for actions in order to engage the king, the city builder, the government, or even the church in order to gain resources, in order to then transform those resources into special abilities, in order to build those towns, in order to gain dominance in those different areas. You're gonna, it's a fantastic production, very thematic, and really another kind of heavy, crunchy game that really is not that challenging as far as long-term gameplay is concerned. Super thematic, super fun, adding ships, adding things to the treasury, great game. That is our number three game, Lisboa. Number two is Food Chain Magnet. All right, this is actually the second game we put on here from Splatter, and Splatter Games, I feel like we could put almost all of them on here. Um, and this is the only company I think we got two games on here for, and that's for good reason. This is the most recent Splatter game. It has taken the board gaming world by storm because it is somehow an extremely heavy game, but also a bit of a mean game, which most don't manage to do. They're not very interactive. Uh, in this game, you have a variable uh, modular player board setup. Um, so there's a map in the middle. Everybody starts in different areas. And the goal of the game is to hire different people uh, from this pool of different workers, train them up to get them different abilities and, you know, build up what they can do, and then use those people to generate demand for specific goods from your particular restaurants that you have built on your map. Now, the interesting part of this game, the very difficult part of this game, is that everybody else is also doing the same thing. And there's a small map and there's a limited number of houses that you're trying to reach. So there are different ways to increase demand through marketing and advertising. People might send out a radio ad or run a, an airplane through the air 
and increase the demand for pizza, for example. And maybe you don't have pizza, but the houses near you really want pizza. So you're not going to be able to sell your goods. Lots of different things to kind of keep in mind and to try to manage throughout this game. You have to keep in mind the wages you have to pay to all the people that are in your uh, worker tree. You have to keep in mind um, the upgrades that you're trying to make, the goods that people want to buy, the resources you currently have, and how many you can keep after they've been produced because you can only keep so many of them. The people you have to hire to produce the goods versus the people you have to hire to sell the goods. There is so much going on here, and yet it all works so perfectly. When you get it just right, it just feels like this perfect machine coming together. The aesthetics here are really nice. The map is not much to look at, but the artwork is very much that 1950s uh, you know, diner style. They have all these cards with all these great illustrations on them. This is a great game. If you lose bad, it can be kind of frustrating, but for some reason, even when that happens, you still want to play again. Uh, that is number two, Food Chain Magnet. All right, so our number one game for the top 10 heavy euros is Vlado Shavatl's Through the Ages, A New Story of Civilization. So many of these great heavy Euro games are great because they allow you to truly experience the changing dynamics of these different economic situations and historical events. Through the Ages, A New Story of Civilization does a, an amazing job of taking us through human civilization from the very start of antiquity up into the modern age. Anthony and I are a huge fan of civilization games. And there's no better game that kind of walks you through civilization, allows you to select particular leaders that are going to guide your civilization only to pass away and then force you to bring on new leaders, new civilizations, new military units, and new technologies that are going to guide your civilization throughout time. So what you did in antiquity is going to affect what you do in modern age. And everything is here. So you go way back as far as Moses and Alexander the Great up to Bill Gates. So throughout the game, you are going to be managing your population's happiness along with all these different types of religion and technologies and science. At the same time, resources are going to be pretty rare. So if you're going to create these great wonders, you have to manage perfectly because it is possible that one of the other civilizations wore fair cards. This game really does set up a beautiful depiction of everything great that Heavy Euros has to offer. Important decisions to be made, great artwork, great integration of theme. So many great heavy games are out there. Even if you're not a heavy gamer, we definitely recommend trying out these fantastic games. All right, Anthony, so that's everything for this time, but that's not it for BGA. Check out our Patreon account, patreon.com backslash BGA. There's more great Patreon episodes. But until next time, this is Chris. And this is Anthony. And we'll save you a seat at our favorite heavy Euro game. <laughs>